Cool. So here's what we're going to be uh, building. Like You guys can go ahead and try and log in as I kind of explain what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to build a multi-tier application that uh, is composed of a few components. Uh, the first component is a jump host. Uh, the role of this host is basically just to allow public connectivity into it. So you can SSH into this host, and then from this host, we're going to be able to access all of the other hosts that we have set up. The other host that we're going to deploy is a few web servers, and those web servers are going to sit behind a load balancer. So when requests are made to the VIP of the load balancer, traffic is going to be load balanced over the two hosts. And we're going to use security groups in order to tighten security. So for instance, only um, TCP port 22 is going to be allowed to come into the jump host. And only from the jump host, we're going to be able to SSH into the web servers. So this allows us to limit kind of our attack vector and also allows us not to put our web servers directly on the WAN. So what we kind of have, what we have set up for you here is uh, this network topology. When you SSH into that IP address, you end on this uh, jump host. And we have uh, two compute nodes, a controller node, and a network node. On all of the nodes we have, except for the controller node, we have uh, an L2 agent. And the L2 agent is responsible for setting up all of the virtual networks. So for instance, in a few minutes, we're going to go ahead and create our own uh, networks. And this agent is responsible for doing the network wiring. Um, one interesting thing that, uh, that Neutron allows you to do is it allows you to do a lot more, allows you to have a lot more advanced networking capabilities and also kind of minimize the amount of network management you need. So for instance, you can see here we have two different compute nodes um, that's attached to this management network, but they're also attached to this uh, second network, which is a data network. And they're both in two different L2 segments that are connected to a router. And, and one cool thing is we can actually provide L2 connectivity between these two compute nodes uh, using overlays. And this uh, data network is also connected to our network node. Um, the network node is uh, the point where traffic from the WAN comes, in, comes into our network. So there's where the L3 agent runs. The L3 agent's responsibility is to provide um, L3 access. So for instance, floating IPs, things of that nature. Um, one of the improvements that was done in Havana is there is work to implement uh, distributed virtual routing. So what that means is east-west traffic um, between, the between instances on compute nodes actually go from hypervisor to hypervisor rather than going through the network node, which was a centralized choke point. Uh, another improvement that was added is um, high availability routers. So now the routers um, use VRRP between each other um, if you're running, if you have this stuff enabled, in order to provide um, active uh, passive type reliability. So we're going to go ahead and uh, jump into the lab. So if you go back to that uh, code pad, um, as you can see, there are a few there are a number of steps that we're going to be doing. The first step that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a private network. So I've kind of drawn out here uh, what these actual steps do, and I'll just catch up to you guys uh, later after I d I'm finished explaining them. So the first command um, that you guys will have to run when you SSH into the box is uh, sourcing that credentials file. What that file does is it puts a few uh, variables in your bash environment that allow the clients to know how to connect to the various OpenStack components. And it also sets the password there for you. So the first command that we're going to go ahead and do is a neutron net create. Um, what this does is this creates a L2 broadcast uh, domain. And then after we go ahead and do that, we're going to add a subnet on top of that network. So we can accomplish that uh, using the neutron subnet com command. It probably makes things easiest if you just copy and paste the commands directly from the code pad into the terminal, because um, there are some instructions that just make it easier rather than having to copy IDs, we use names and things like that. So after you attach a subnet to a network, uh, what Neutron allows you to do is when you create ports on that network, uh, ports are automatically allocated IP addresses for you. And then there's a DHCP agent um, that goes ahead and allocates out those IP addresses uh, or gives you DHCP responses for requests um, on this network for that subnet. So I'm going to go ahead and do that as well.
So the next thing that we need to do is we need to go. We need to create a router. So what the router does is it allows us to uplink this net network to actual like internet to the WAN. So the first step that in doing that is just to create a router. So we do that via issuing the command neutron um, router create, and then we give it a name. So here we just called it my router. After we create the router then we have to uplink the router to a network. So in this lab setup, we just have one physical network, but you could actually have multiple uh, WANs that you connect to. Um, so for instance, at VMware, we have several different physical networks, one that's uh, one that connects inside of the VMware internet, and then another one that actually connects to the public internet uh, directly, and then another one that yet again connects to a different type of physical network. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use Neutron Router Gateway Set, pass in the router, and the network that we want to connect to. So just a pretty simple question. Um, on the associate subnet line, yes. the cider, or whatever you want to call it, 10.0.0.24, yep. is that making sure that it is always 10.0.0.24? You can't throw like 192.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
How's everyone doing at this point? Is everyone able to follow along, or is anyone stuck? Cool. So, is it possible to get the slides as well? Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, post the slides on the internet. I'll, I'll, I'll tweet out the link afterwards, or I can give it to you directly. So after we've we're getting a internal server error 500 back from the API from the internal server network there. Cool. So the next step that we're going to go ahead and do is uh, use this Nova key pair add. So this is kind of a a useful thing uh, that you can use is you can add your SSH key um, to Nova, and then you can tell Nova when you boot the instance you want to uh, provide that SSH key. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to SSH into your instance without having to have a hard-coded password into the disk image. So this way you don't have an image in your infrastructure that's deployed, and everyone knows the password, and then everyone kind of SSH into it. Uh, because it's the same password. But it kind of also demos uh, that Neutron actually has these capabilities to inject um, these key pairs over the network. So this leverages the metadata service. And there's a metadata agent that's responsible for actually receiving the request and um, dispatching or inserting the instance ID and dispatching it to Nova in order to make this work. So after you upload the key, you can go ahead and list that from Nova to see that it's actually there if you want with Nova key pair list. You can see it has my key. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, boot our jump host. So before we do that, there's this uh, one command here that's just used just to kind of make things easier. It goes ahead and determines the UUID of the private subnet. This way you don't have to copy and paste it. Um, and you can just reference this variable directly. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, boot my first instance. So you can see here we pass in an image, which is the Cirrus, default Cirrus image. Um, you can see which images are available via Nova flavor list or Nova image list. You can see there's uh, two images available. Um, you can also, uh, the next thing is the key pair. So you can see we passed in my key, which is the one we just uploaded. Um, we also passed in uh, this, uh, the network that we want to be on. So if you do neutron net list, that'll show you the available networks. So we see we just have two, the private and the public network. And, um, and then we also pass in the security groups that we want to be associated with the instance. So we can go ahead and run this command nova list, which will tell us the status of the instance to see if it's booted yet or if it's still in scheduling state or what's going on with it. You can see uh, my instance is uh, already active. Um, and it has the IP address 10.0.0.2. So one thing, so the next thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to associate a floating IP with this instance. So at this point, uh, there's this instance that's sitting behind that router, but we're not actually able to access it directly because uh, there's no public IP address in order to get into it. Yes? Your instance is in error state? OK, so there could be a few different reasons uh, 
uh, why it's an error state. I think there's some race condition in the NIT scripts um, for the schedulers. Um, can you look at that real quick? Cool, so the next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna associate a, a floating IP with this private, or with this instance. So to do that, we need to figure out the port ID uh, that is attached to the instance. So one of the, there are several different ways you can do that. Um, you can do neutron port list and find the one that associates with 10.0.0.2 or you can search for it. So just to make things easy, we can uh, search for it with this command. And this returns us the, the UUID of the, of the port, the MAC address, the subnet, and the IP address that is associated with that. So we're going to go ahead and associate this uh, port with a floating IP. So to do that, you use neutron floating IP create. And you can pass in the, floating IP, the port ID directly in order to create it in one API call. Or you could also create a floating IP and associate it later. But just to make things simpler, we'll just go ahead and create that in one step. And then the second parameter to this command is the network that we want to create this floating IP on. Since we only have the public network, um, that's the only one available, so we'll pass in public here. One of the new things that was actually added in Juno was uh, statuses to floating IPs. Previously, you could create floating IPs, but you wouldn't actually know if they were working or not. So now when you create a floating IP, you can see it's in down state, and then we can actually query the status of the, the floating IP, and, and it gets set to active whenever the backend implementation actually uh, associates it. So in this case, we're using all the open source components. Uh, this is using ML2 and the L3 agent. So if we do uh, neutron floating IP show, hopefully this should be in active state. Cool, and it is. So if everything was actually done correctly on the back end, we should be able to SSH into this guest without using a password because we specified um, the SSH key uh, to be added automatically for us in the instance. So I'm going to see if we can do that. Cool, so as you can see, we're able to SSH directly into the instance. So is everyone at this point? Sure, so the ID that I used was the floating IP um, ID to the floating IP that was returned from the command uh, neutron floating IP create. No, that's the ID that was uh, returned. The floating network ID is the public network that we passed in at the end. Okay, so at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and exit out of this instance, and then we're going to create a few more security groups that we're going to use for our web tier. So the next few steps here, um, we're going to go ahead and create a security group called web, and then we're going to install a few rules into it. So the first rule that we install into it um, allows uh, TCP port 80 into it, and the second rule that we install is slightly more interesting. Um, it allows TCP uh, port 22 into it, but only from members who are part of the jump host group. So this allows us to constrict who is actually able to access this instance. So one of the cool things is if, we, if one of our jump hosts goes down or if we want to scale up the number of jump hosts we, can, we have, we can just go ahead and boot more jump hosts, passing in which security group they are on, and these other instances will automatically allow access from it to it directly, so we don't actually have to deal with IP addresses directly updating them as part of the security group rules. Is 
Yep, the remote group ID has actually been available since Grizzly. Um, because in Folsom, there wasn't actually a security group, a security group API in Neutron, but since uh, Grizzly, it's had it. And also, Nova Network supports the same construct. Okay. Uh, is there any way to configure the input mode to automatically assign a floating IP from the system? I'm aware that it was possible in Nova Network, but I'm not sure if in Neutron that's possible. Um, today, uh, it's not directly possible via Neutron, but you could definitely do this outside of Neutron, having additional orchestration to do this type of thing for you. Or you could also create a different type of network. For instance, you could have a provider network that's on a network that actually has public addresses. So if you wanted to actually allocate a public IP address for everyone automatically, you could go that route of just exposing or connecting that network directly to that where the public connectivity is. So you would allocate public IPs directly. Um, alternatively, you would have to do it outside, but do it via the API. Cool, so uh, after I've created that web security group, we're gonna go ahead and boot uh, two instances that we're gonna use as web servers. So you can see when I do Nova List, um, now we have three hosts. We have the jump host, web server one, and web server two. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're just going to set up this uh, dummy uh, HTTP server that just returns the name of the instance. So what we'll, what we'll have to do is we'll have to actually SSH to the jump host in order to get to web server one and web server two. So if you find that SSH command, we'll go ahead and SSH to uh, that first jump host. And then we'll SSH to the other web servers. So once you get to that box, you'll have to type SSH 10.0.0.5. And then the password is going to be cubswin with a colon and a smiley face. It should be, it's right here in the, in the launchpad doc. And the reason why you're not able to actually SSH from, this ho from the jump host into our web server hosts without, um, like automatically, is because the public or the private key does not reside on the jump host um, that we uploaded the public key for. Is it the same username? Yep, it's the same username. So once, once you do that, uh, we want to run uh, these commands. So this first command. Uh, just runs a little loop that returns back uh, the string over netcat. So after I insert that command, I'll exit out. So it's kind of confusing. Um, right now, I'm on web server one. I type exit, I'm on the jump host. And then I'll SSH to uh, five. Uh, the password is cubswin uh, with a smiley face. It's in the, it's in the actual code pad, uh, a little bit higher in it. And after you do that, you should be able to curl to either web server one and web server two, and it'll return a different string. Is it prompting you for a password? Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, sorry, it just says that, but they need to type in the 10.0.0. .0 .0 the actual IP address of it. Is it a web server? Yeah, oh. sorry. So at this point, you can see I can curl to either one of these two web servers, and it'll return the actual name uh, that it has. Uh, it shows this. But you need to do that from the jump host. And you need to type in its IP address. So for instance, it's. Yep, curl 10.0.0.5.4 returns web server 2. And if you do it on the 4 one, it's web server 1. So the next step that we're going to go ahead and is uh, are some people up to this point? OK, cool. So we're going to go ahead and continue. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to create a, uh, a load balancing pool. And after we create that, we're going to go ahead and add these two web servers to this pool. So I'm going to go ahead and do that as well. So for the load balancing methods, I don't think it's actually exposed on the client side. But if we looked in the API, there's, um, there's a few different uh, like random distributions of load balancing. But you could also have like a vendor extension to do load balancing based on like uh, different types of things. Like for instance, if you had some kind of like agents on your server in order to calculate load or something like that. But uh, using this uh, implementation that we have here, this is just using HAProxy. So it supports a few of them, round robin, some kind of um, uh, random distribution. And uh, yeah, probably least, least connection as well. I'd have to look. I'm not sure off the top of my head. So after you create the load balancing pool and add the two web server nodes in it, uh, the next thing that we're actually going to do is we're going to create a health monitor. So what the health monitor does is it tells us, um, so basically it monitors the, the liveliness of the host. So uh, the one that we're going to use is going to wait three seconds, um, and it's going to do an HTTP check, uh, check to see if like HTTP port 80 is returning, and it's going to retry it three times. And after it doesn't hear back after three attempts, then it's going to mark it down in the pool. Yeah, I think that you can actually use the same one for. Actually, it looks like it looks like you can't, um, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Right. I I agree. This is kind of a deficiency in the API. I know that there are some people that are working on improvements to the load balancer API, but there are several like shortcomings <laughs> in it. But yeah, that's a good point. So in order to find the IP address for the web servers, if you do Nova list, that should return the IP addresses for you. Uh, the password is in the doc. It says Cubs win. If you search for it in the code pad, it's C-U-B-S-W-I-N colon uh, open parens or close parens.
So I associated the, the health check with the pool. And the next thing that we're actually going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a VIP. Um, so we tell it the port that we want the VIP bound on, the traffic that it's expecting, and the subnet um, that we want it to be created on. So as you can see, this returns this private IP address here. And this actually creates a port for us. So one of the nice things is you can do load balancing internally. For instance, if, you're, if you don't want your load balancer facing the public um, outside on the public infrastructure, so say you want to load balance MySQL connections or something like that internally, you can uh, use this to do that. So after we create this VIP, we want to go ahead and associate the port with a floating IP, so this way we can access that um, externally. So after that is done, we should be able to curl to this floating IP and see that it's automatically well balanced. So you can see that works. If I hit it once, it says web server one. If I hit it another time, it says web server two. So one of the cool things of this is it allows us to horizontally scale out our application a little bit using the load balancer. And it also provides us a little bit high availability. Like in a moment, we'll go ahead and delete one of the web servers. And then we'll see when we make the request, only one of the web servers will actually return a response. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're just going to quickly demo the firewall as a service stuff. And what that does is that allows us to actually do additional filtering at the router. So the first step to do that is we're going to create a default firewall policy. And then we're going to go ahead and associate, um, and then we're going to go ahead and create a firewall and associate it with that policy. Uh, the default policy is actually blocked. So what happens is we're no longer able to connect into the instance. So in order to allow connections again, we have to create another rule. So this rule allows HTTP traffic in. So we'll go ahead and create this rule and then insert it into the firewall. So after you do that, you can see connectivity is now restored and we can actually connect in. So this allows us just to do an additional uh, filtering at the router. Um, to filter out additional traffic that we don't actually want to reach our guests. So the last thing uh, that we can demo is if we do Nova List, we can actually delete one of these web servers, and we can s see that Neutron will actually take it out of the load balancing pool. Um, so only one of the web servers that are going to return its name. So I'll just go ahead and delete web server one. So it actually takes about nine or 10 seconds for this actually to be pulled out of the load balancer pool because it waits three times and it, um, it's, it retries uh, three times and it waits three times. So now if I curl to this, it should only be returning web server two or web server one. I guess I copied and pasted uh, the names differently. Uh, one more thing that I'd like to demo for you guys is this is actually deployed in our cloud at VMware. Uh, running on top of NSX. So in your labs, you're actually using the open source components, but underneath, that's using the NSX plugin uh, that's powering all of these labs. Yeah, so we're going to actually leave these labs up for a couple of days, and you can go ahead and re-register and recreate another lab if you, if you want to. Uh, can you add the presentation link on the page? On the yep, I will. Uh, what would you like me to explain? why we didn't add the firewall policy? We do at the end. Not without adding the po policy to allow uh, the traffic in, because by default, it blocks uh, traffic.
So I'm just uh, VPNing in really quick to show you this. Again. I uh, have a lens. I want to get any assistance for it. Is it more than I did on the first time? <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure then. I think we'll probably have to, like, maybe if you allocate the same lab, it's just not easy. Yeah, that would be Does it say it's connected? Sorry about this. We had to switch from one laptop to another. So. Hey, Rosen. It's just two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. Um, there is one more component if you want to see what the actual physical If later on in the week you guys want to go ahead and redo the lab or continue on it, we'll go ahead and leave the labs uh, accessible uh, for a while, for at least a week or so. Or if you have any questions at this point, like we can like open up the floor for questions or anything like that. Can you just SSH into it instead of using oh. that? That might be the easiest bet. Yeah, if you just copy that and SSH to Sarah. Or just Nasera is the username. How's it going?
two different services on two on the same two virtual machines? I think no. Yeah, that, that was the question that uh, that gentleman over there asked, yeah. and it seems like uh, it's not, it's not, not today. In the mall, in the mall, yes. But the API could definitely be extended to allow like a list of services or something like that in order to be able to do this. But I don't think today it does. Not today. No, this is Kilo, or this is uh, Juno. This is Juno. Right. Okay. So in Kilo, maybe if someone maybe. adds it. If you if you want to add it, you can add it, and then it could, we can show it next time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. This thing isn't <laughs> the VPN doesn't seem to be working. Uh, VPN. Okay. The second package allows VPN. Oh no, there wasn't a VPN. Component. The VPN component only allows you to kind of like connect different logical routers uh, yeah. together. So there's uh, not really much. I don't know. It doesn't really add add much. So all the VPN stuff it does today is just allows you to connect two different virtual routers. And you can actually connect two different virtual routers between different OpenStack deployments if, if you want. So you have to have multiple OpenStack deployments to kind of like demo that. So there is an VPN part. Uh, okay. so, uh, that there were, oh, so what I wanted to show is on top of this, this runs on NSX. And the NSX is pow powering all yeah, the VMware product. So the code that you ran in the lab was using ML2, the open source implementation, but the actual code that's running all of the labs underneath it is uh, like the VMware code. Okay. Um, so I was going to show how that actually looks. And there's actually like a ton of tools that actually operationalize it, so you can actually see where things are and like ping things in the underlay and overlay. Um, <coughs> but it's not working. No, oh, it does work, but it's <laughs> yeah. uh, the network VPN, yeah, okay, okay, something good. like that. Uh, I have another question. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, do you, uh, can you use a load balancer between two virtual um, machines on two different regions? On two different networks? Yes, on two different regions oh, with the VPN SSLs, for example. Uh, with with VPN? the same virtual IP, mm -hmm. but uh, on two machines, not in the same uh, region, right. but in, in two different uh, regions. It, it seems like not today. The load balancer API has a lot of problems. Okay, not today. Not Maybe today. in Kilo. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you can contribute it and fix, fix it. Okay. Another question, if sure. I can. Sure. Sure. Um, it's possible to use, in Havana, my colleague used uh, um, a, um, a shared network. Okay. Okay. And uh, the machines with private uh, virtual keys. Should work. I would guess it it's some work. kind of configuration. Yeah, absolutely. Be, uh, Can I do this in my house the all the time? Machine the machine uh, configured the private network is uh, on gray tunnels. Is on what? Gray tunnels. Okay, I'm not sure, but it sounds like G a good. Oh, GRE. Yes. Yeah. It, it should work. work. Yeah, so it sounds like a configuration problem or some kind of routing issue or something like that. So it definitely should work. The last question is it is not possible to choose a port for the new key directly. Right, not, not today. <laughs> talk to this guy why that is. Ah, okay. Oh, it's because like they, we don't want to like automatically. So you, you, can, you can take one from the pool, but yeah. not ch uh, choose right. which one. We don't want to allow the tenant. <laughs> maybe in key 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 or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really. That's really like, why do you want to choose? You should just necessarily care the IP address that you're allocated because for one thing is we don't want to allow a tenant to take an IP, then like do a bunch of bad things and then get another IP and then you get his IP. And then now that IP doesn't work because okay. a lot of people in the internet have blocked it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the motivation for that. But so the IPAM. It, 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 it will be never, never. Maybe. I mean, if there's a use case for, for doing it, um, then. Uh, yes, because if I, I have a, a service on a, a particular virtual IP, mm -hmm. on a particular floating IP. Right. But the instance then doesn't I, know. I change, I change the virtual machine. and. Uh, I released the, this floating uh, Oh, and so, d so then you not with another tenant to take in. Oh, okay. In that case, case, gotcha. 
in this case, it's, it's better to use a, a shared network, uh, probably. Um, not really, because the shared network has nothing to do with the floating IPs. Yeah, um, yeah, no. so, so in that case... Yeah, public. Right. So I understand the use case, but today it doesn't support, support that. Um, but you could change the code to make that possible. Yeah. There's actually a uh, problem for you to have a question. We can set up yeah. or shoot, shoot me an email, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. My email address is A Rosen. Okay, this is my card just in case I can't find you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, a Rosen at VMware.com. Okay, cool. Can you share the slides? Yeah, I'll put it on twi Twitter. Uh, Aaron O Rosen. I'll do that after the talk. A A R O N O R O S E N. What can I do for you? It doesn't work. Thanks. Great lab. Uh, thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't get to show the NSX bits, but below it, this is all running on. All of this is running on top of NSX, yeah. which is a VMware product, um, which is just powering all of the labs. So inside of your lab, you are running ML2, but below it, uh -huh. so all the physical and things. You can show VMware product. all the labs. So yeah, so you can actually see all the labs, visualize it, and it has that connectivity to all the well, is the VPN wasn't working. Like I switched, yeah. there was some problem on my laptop with Linux and the display. So You're not working in a, some car, some sort of network company anyway. No, uh, yeah, VPN yeah. here. I don't know. I think yeah, it might be RSA. Anyway, Actually, right, I think right. it's Mac because this works <laughs> under Linux. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah. Something with peace. <laughs> yep, it's me. Thanks. Hey, um, How's it going? from the jump box, can my other instance, should I have been able to? You should only be able to ping the jump box. The jump box. Oh, you couldn't ping from the jump from box? The jump box yeah, yeah, you shouldn't. I don't think so. You should have been able to because the only rule that we allowed okay. from is uh, the SSH. I don't know, Parker. You could SSH from the right? Yeah, yeah. So that's because it's a security control. Even though the jump box is on the same layer, same. Yep. That's the, that's the nice thing. Is now you can partition your network however you want via like security rules instead of actually caring about these networks. If you want. Like you can define connectivity via security rules rather than the network. Okay, so even though they're. Zero, yep, even though they're on the same L2, this the enforcement, the router, so no, it doesn't go through the router, uh, the router. It, kind of no, it goes actually there. directly, but like on the VIF that attaches to the yeah. bridge, that's where the security is implemented, on the edge. Okay, uh, cool, thank you. Cool, sure, no problem. I'm sure it has, uh, I don't know what it was, but when I tried to call, uh, I messed up the, the high stuff.